All God's people said, Amen. Amen. If you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 as we continue our study here in this passage. Uh, we're going through um, chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians during our 40 days of love in preparation for Easter, and we're praying that you're uh, preparing yourself spiritually and uh, getting ready for this time of celebration of the Lord's resurrection. And again, going back to that uh, Operation Andrew card we gave you, be sure to make your Easter journey a part of someone else's Easter journey. Begin to invite them, pray for them, uh, have them come and be a part of the Easter celebration that uh, we're going to have this uh, Easter. Today we're talking about love speaks the truth. Love speaks the truth. And we're looking at 1 Corinthians 13, uh, verse 6. Uh, let me just ask you a question as we start. Are you a skunk or a turtle? That's a loaded question, isn't it? All right. When, when it comes to conflict, are you a skunk or a turtle? If you're a turtle, you kind of just duck your head and hide. You don't want to confront anyone. If you're a skunk... You don't care who smells what you're uh, feeling like and and, uh, how you think about it. All right? So are you a skunk or a turtle? Okay? All all of us can be one way or the other, but but somewhere in there, there's a middle ground, isn't there? You don't have to be a turtle. You don't have to be a skunk. There has to be a way of learning how to confront uh, someone and deal with conflict that's going on in uh, a person's life life and in your life. And so today we're, we're continuing this series uh, called 40 Days of Love. And as uh, we looked at chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians again, remember we said uh, starting out that uh, our primary goal is to let love be our highest goal. And so last week we talked about some of the traits of love. And uh, we said that uh, uh, there's, there's two basic hallmarks called patience and kindness. And today we're looking at another mark of love, another trait of love, and that is truth. Truth. As uh, the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 13, 6, love rejoices with the truth. Love rejoices with the truth. And um, most people, when they think about the phrase keeping the peace, uh, they think that means that they are to avoid confrontation, when in actuality, um, that's just repressing the truth rather than dealing with the truth. They, they don't want to cause trouble, they think, so they try to just repress the truth instead of confronting someone with the truth. But notice what it says in Proverbs 10.10, 10. someone who holds back the truth causes trouble. But one who openly criticizes works for peace. Now that's a little bit different than we normally think of it, isn't it? We usually think in terms of, uh, I just won't say anything, maybe the problem will go away. But in actuality, the problem worsens. There's more trouble. And so someone who doesn't confront the situation actually causes trouble. And uh, what we need to do is have people who are willing to confront a problem and deal with it head on and speak the truth in love. And uh, that's what our theme is today. Love speaks the truth. Love speaks the truth. As as Paul writes in Ephesians 4.15, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ. Now, can you ever think of a time in the New Testament where Jesus failed to speak the truth? And can you ever think of a time in the New Testament when Jesus failed to speak the truth in love? And yet, at times, he was quite brutal, wasn't he? He looked at Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. I mean, he wasn't worried about Peter's feelings, was he? He was dealing with the truth. When when, uh, they said that Herod was inquiring about Jesus, Jesus said, Go, go tell that old fox to get out of here. 
He wasn't afraid of political leaders either. Jesus spoke the truth and he spoke it in love. He was willing to deal and confront with problems. He, he loved people who were caught up in sin and he was willing to eat with them and, and he got criticized for it. But he, was, he found those people more real than the Pharisees who were doing the criticism. He, he says it, it's uh, not the, the uh, healthy people who need help. It's those who are ill, those who are hurting, those who are sinners. They're the ones that need help. So I'm going to work with them. And, and you healthy, quote, righteous people, go take care of yourselves. Jesus wasn't afraid to confront the truth and, and to deal with problems that he uh, found his way. He was willing to speak the truth in love. So what we're dealing with today is that love speaks the truth. So how do we go about speaking the truth in the spirit of love? Well, that's what we're going to look at today, how to speak the truth in love. So kind of bear with me because we're going to go through a lot of uh, different approaches and, and ways in which you can speak the truth in love when dealing with a problem. Now let me uh, first of all just say what do we mean by problems? Well, okay, uh, your wife won't talk to you because she's upset at you and you can't really understand why. Is that an issue? Mm -hmm. Fred says no, he's single. <laughs> your husband uh, goes out and does his own thing, comes home, and... He, he won't just talk to you where he's been or what he's been doing. Is that an issue? <laughs> okay. You're, you're on the job and your coworker is vying for your job and so they're saying things about you that aren't true. Is that an issue? There's a bully at school that won't shut up and keeps pestering you. Is that an issue? You see, there's all kinds of these issues out there, and they need confronted. So how do you do that? How do, how do you speak the truth and love to those kind of issues? And you just personalize this today. You decide what the issue is that you need to deal with and how you need to talk with someone about the truth. The first thing you need to do is check your motives. Check your motives. When you go to approach someone about the issue, just check your motives and ask yourself, what is the right motive? How, how do I approach this situation? Well, the best approach is to help and not to hurt. To help and not to hurt. If your primary goal is to get back and retaliate, your motives are not pure, okay? Your motives are not right. You've got to come to a place where you really want to deal with the issue instead of trying to win a point. Now, one of the problems with our politics in America today is everybody's more interested in winning a point for their side than they are speaking the truth and getting things done for the good of the nation. They're more interested in winning favors for the Republicans or the Democrats than they are about the helping the American people. And hopefully someone will finally begin to realize those motives aren't pure and they're hurting our country rather than helping our country. So what are your motives? What, what are you doing when you go to this individual to confront the situation? And, and really, this is not easy because emotions are involved here. If someone hurts you, if someone says uh, something against you falsely, if someone's lying about you, that makes you upset, doesn't it? You've got to be honest about it. It's not fair. It's not right. I'm angry. So you've got to work through those emotions. But then when you're ready to confront this issue, you've got to check your motives and, and decide that you're going to help and not to hurt. You're really going to try to resolve the issue and have the right attitude. Notice what it says in 2 Corinthians 12, 19. Perhaps you think we're saying these things just to defend ourselves. No, we tell you this as Christ's servants and with God as our witness. 
Everything we do, dear friends, is to strengthen you. So Paul was uh, talking to the Corinthian church, and he was saying, you, you might be thinking I'm saying these hard things because I'm trying to defend myself. No, what I'm trying to do is resolve the situation. I want us to be peaceful with each other. I want us to have an open relationship. I want us to make sure that, that you are strengthened and encouraged and helped. That's what I want to do. And, and as Christ, as God is my witness, as a servant of Christ, that's what I want. I want us all to be on the same page together, living in harmony, living in love, living in unity. Now, if that's not your goal, if that's not your motive, then you got wrong motives. And, and listen, it's going to take some brutal honesty with yourself because it's not easy to be pure in your motives because we all want to defend ourselves we all want to make sure that we come out looking good and the other person comes out looking bad. Can I hear an amen? amen. That wasn't too strong, I'm sorry. Amen. Wasn't too strong. Listen, the goal is, as Christians, we all want to be on the same page and love one another. Amen? amen. That means you're going to have to swallow some pride, humble yourself, and be willing to treat another person with respect and love to make sure they are strengthened, as Paul says, and helped and uplifted so you can work together in love. So, in other words, to go from shallow to intimate relationships, you need to go through this tunnel of truth where you deal with issues you really don't want to deal with. And, and most of our relationships are pretty shallow, whether it's in the home whether it's in the church, whether it's on the job, or with our neighbors, we have pretty shallow relationships. Very few times do we have to go deep. And that's what this tunnel of truth is. If you really want to have a relationship that is intimate, a relationship that is honest and authentic, you've got to go deal with the hard issues sometimes. You've got to go deep. You've got to look the person in the eye and deal with the situation in, instead of just trying to ignore it or skim over it or, or just excuse it or deny it or repress it. you got to deal with it, and you got to confront the individual, and you got to talk with them and go into that tunnel of truth. Instead of just skimming across the surface, you got to go in. you got to go deep. you got to go down. You, you know, this is especially true in marriage, isn't it? It's really true in marriage. You can't have an intimate relationship in marriage if you aren't honest with each other, if you don't talk about your problems, if you don't talk about your issues. And yet, and yet we have a lot of marriages where people don't really deal with the problem at hand. You know, you hear about the big elephant in the room that nobody talks about. A lot of marriages have that going on. And they need to talk about the elephant in the room. They, they need to deal with it. They need to talk about those issues that are causing their marriage to suffer and hurt. And, and unfortunately, as a pastor, I deal with families all the time where there's just really no communication going on. Everybody's going and doing their own thing, and no one's talking to each other, and yet the problems keep rising and rising and rising, and and the next thing they know, one of their kids has run off or, or one of their family members is now taking drugs or, or uh, the husband is having an affair. They never talked about the issues that were going on in their family. They weren't willing to tunnel down into the issues and deal with it truthfully and honestly. So especially in marriage, you, you have to go into the tunnel of truth and begin to deal with those issues and talk to one another in love. So check your motives and be sure you're willing to go deep and do it from a pure motive behind it. So how do you do that? Well, what you have to do is plan your presentation. You, you decided here's the issue, here's the conflict, how am I going to deal with it? How am I going to approach the person? Well, you need to plan it. You need to think in your mind, how am I going to approach the individual? 
Proverbs 16, 23 says, Intelligent people think before they speak. What they say is then more persuasive. Well, um, this is just an aside off the cuff, top of my head. We've got a lot of people that aren't very intelligent, don't we? Because they think before they speak. They don't think before they speak. Intelligent people think before they speak. In other words, you need to plan ahead. You need to know what you're going to say. You don't just do it off the cuff. You, you go to the individual and you're, you're going to be willing to talk with that person. And you plan how you're going to speak with them in order to be persuasive. And remember, you're doing it from good motives. You've worked through your emotions. You've worked through the issue. You want to win a brother or a sister back. You want to be on the same page with them. You want to let them know that you love them. And you want the situation resolved. So, so here's some keys to presenting the truth in love. Plan when you're going to say it. When are you going to say it? When are you going to sit down with the person and talk with them about it? Okay, so you need to plan when. Don't say it when the person's tired, under pressure, or in a hurry. Okay? Uh, so often, uh, this happens in families. Everybody's rushing, rushing by each other. And, and uh, the one spouse wants to say something to the other spouse, but the other spouse is in a hurry, so they say something out loud, off the cuff. The other spouse doesn't need to hear, or the other spouse hears and misunderstands what's being said, and pretty soon there's more trouble. Or, or a spouse comes home from work, and they're completely tired and worn out. They're exhausted. And, and the other spouse says, we got to talk. Please, not now. I can't deal. I've, I've had so many people ste stepping on that last nerve, you know, all day long. I really don't have time to talk about this. I don't feel like I'm tired. So be sure you don't try to present the truth. You don't try to deal with the situation and confront the individual when they're tired or under pressure or in a hurry. I remember uh, uh, there's a fella in, in my church in Ohio, and I've told you a story before. Um, he was a Sunday school teacher. He was a deacon. Um, but he, he thought he was pastor of the church, and he controlled that little Sunday school class. And every Sunday would, would say lies about me, if you want to be frank. He would tell, tell things that just weren't true. And it, it just started building ahead. And pretty soon people in that class were beginning to think I was this ogre or something, a terrible person. And I kept hearing rumors about it. So, so I went to the guy and said, what's going on here? I don't know what you're talking about. He wasn't willing to talk about it. And, um, and so finally I went to some of the deacons and said, you know, this is going on. I've had several reports. So the deacons, uh, according to Matthew 18, they sent a couple people to talk with him. And, uh, of course, he got all upset and offended. That pastor, he's out to get me and blah, blah, blah. And, and so it just kept going downhill. And it was, we tried to follow Matthew 18 and do what the Scripture says as far as confronting the person individually as uh, the church and then we're the next step was to bring it before the church so the deacons wrote him a letter saying uh, we want you to come and address this problem with the deacon body if you don't then we're going to have to address it to the church and, and and bring it before the the body of Christ well oh he was so upset and one day I get a phone call and I wasn't expecting I was in the hallway of the church I picked up the phone uh, the secretary was doing something else I said hello First Baptist Logan and he goes, this is Stan. He said, I want you to stop doing what you're doing. I got this letter and blah, blah, blah. And he, he just took off and started going on and on about me and about my mama and everybody else, okay? And he was just uh, really upset. <coughs> and I said, hey, stop the lies. Stop the lies. Now, what was wrong with that situation? It wasn't planned. <laughs> And so I said a few things I shouldn't have said. He said a few things he shouldn't have said. And, and he was willing to use that as ammunition against me later on. You see, you've got you to plan when you're going to say it. You've you got to be careful you 
avoid those situations where a person's tired or under pressure or in a hurry uh, or just off the cuff. You've got to be careful about that. And, and in marriage, you especially have to do that. You have to be sure you don't just do it off the cuff. You set a time and you take consideration for how the person's feeling. So when you plan, <coughs> do it when it's the best timing for the person. Do it when the person is rested and, and ready to hear it. Do it when you both are at your best. And, and do it when you have privacy. Be willing to, to do that when you have privacy. Um, there's something called marriage staff meetings. What's a marriage staff meeting? It means that you set an appointment to actually sit down and meet. How's that for a novel idea? Because everybody's usually going in a hundred different directions, especially if you have a lot of little kids running around. But you've got to set a time, a marriage staff meeting time, where nobody else is around. You sit down face-to-face -face and talk with your spouse <coughs> and begin to deal with the issue. That way you can be constructive in the way you deal with what's going on in your marriage. Um, I had, had another deacon there in, in Logan who uh, tried to dismiss me three times and um, he uh, I don't I just don't know what his problem was but he just had it out for me and so uh, we went through it a couple times and <coughs> one time it had to do with his daughter and so I I said okay we need to talk he goes well I don't have time to talk I said okay let's get with the deacons and talk because he was a deacon. And so we got some of the deacons together. We all sat down and we planned it. And we each took turns. He shared what his thoughts were. I shared what my thoughts were. And we were able to go back and forth. And what it, what it came down to was he was upset because he thought that the church had failed his daughter. And that's why she had gone out and gotten pregnant. Okay, now... How do you reason that? How do you deal with that? She got pregnant, and it's the church's fault. I mean, how can you deal with that? I, I don't know, but because it was the church's fault, guess whose fault it ultimately was? Mine, because I was the pastor of the church. Okay? And I assure you, I didn't make her pregnant, really. Okay? And so he, he had uh, this root of bitterness in his heart, and uh, he, he just was taking it out on me. But we were able to sit down and talk it out and be able to find out what was going on with him so that the deacons could really start ministering to him and his family. We didn't even know his daughter was pregnant. But yet that's the reason why he was acting the way he was. But sitting down and, and, and working it through together, looking for a resolution that all parties could agree on, we ultimately came to a place where we helped him and his family. But it didn't happen accidentally. You had to plan it. You had to deal with that situation to, to make sure it, it was resolved in a proper way. So, so there are ways in which you can handle these issues, but you have to plan your presentation. So not only do you plan when you're going to say it, you also have to plan what you're going to say. Plan what you're going to say. Proverbs 25, 11, the right word at the right time is like precious gold set in silver. Precious gold set in silver. The right word at the right time. Be sure you know what you're going to say. Be sure you're, you're willing to say it in a way that's going to resolve the issue and, and really help the situation. Remember, our goal is to help, not to hurt. So plan what you're going to say. So If you have to write it down, write it down. I've had couples that I said, look, you guys can't even talk to each other civilly, so go write a letter to each other. The next time we meet, you can each read each other's letter, and that way you'll know what the other person's thinking. That's how bad it was in their situation. But, but be sure you plan what you're going to say. And as you do that, you're able to communicate and, and get some progress in the situation. So, so the first thing you need to deal with is the introduction. The introduction. 
how you introduce a touchy subject will determine whether it's going to be received well or rejected. All right? So if you approach someone, they're not expecting this, you have to be sure you know what you're going to say, and then you have to be sure you do it in the right way because otherwise they'll just reject you outright. So uh, a few um, clues here. Don't start with sarcasm or anger. Don't start with sarcasm or anger. If you come at it angry, they're going to get defensive. They're going to back off. If, you, if you're sarcastic, they're going to get defensive. and They're going to back off. You do start with humility and gentleness. You come to them saying, look, I want what's best for us. I want to make sure this is resolved. I don't like this conflict we're having, so, so we need to, to work on it. And, and you bring it up the best way you can. You know, there's a right way to do it and, and a wrong way to introduce a topic to someone. I remember the story of a pastor um, who was approached by a man in town, and this man came from a non-church-going heathen family. They were wild, and everybody knew they were crooks. They were violent, they were drunkards, they were drug addicts. Uh, they had all kinds of problems and histories of that town, never attended church at all. Yet the man came, his brother died, the man came to the pastor and said, Pastor, I want you to uh, do my brother's funeral. And, and the pastor said, are you sure about this? You never go to church at all. I want you, pastor, to do my brother's funeral. And pastor... I want you to know, I want you to say all the positive good things you can in the world about him. Because if you don't, I'm going to beat you to a pulp. So the pastor kind of felt put out and he, he said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. So he's thinking to himself, how am I going to approach this? How, how am I going to deal with this conflict? This man's going to beat me up if I don't say something nice about his, his uh, scoundrel of a brother. So uh, the pastor got up in the pulpit on the day of the funeral, and he went on and on about uh, Joe was, was a, a man who was mean to the bone. And Joe would as soon uh, fight and knock someone out as he would uh, just to, to take care of them. Joe was a drunkard and a thief. And we all know his history. He was in and out of jail. And, and Joe was just such a horrible person, a despicable person. But we're here to pay respects to him today. But I want you to know something. Compared to Joe, compared to his brother down front, Joe was a saint. <laughs> so he said something positive about it. I would, I, would, I would say it's probably not the best way to approach uh, a subject. Don't introduce it that way, okay? Not the best way. Don't s start with sarcasm or anger. Do it with humility and gentleness. And, and then use illustrations. Use illustrations. Illustrations help a person to picture uh, what you want to say. Use word pictures. Uh, say it in such a way where they can think of it, they can see it in their mind, what you're trying to say. Uh, try to use word pictures that will help them understand what you're trying to get across to them. And uh, use illustrations the person understands. Use illustrations the person understands. For instance, uh, you're, you're talking to your wife and you're trying to, to get across a point and you say, remember when you stubbed your big toe and it made you cry? Yeah. Well, that's how I feel when. So now they understand the pain. You see, you've got to give a picture in their mind that they can relate to to let them know how you're feeling. And don't just choose illustrations you like. Make sure it's illustrations that actually relate to the person you're talking to, not some that you just like because they might not completely understand what you're trying to say. So you need to just paint word pictures in such a way that that person knows what you're talking about. So you come with it at the right approach, and, and you make sure you use illustrations that the person can identify with. So you plan when you're going to say it, you plan what you're going to say, and then you plan how you're going to say it. 
You plan how you're going to say it. Because there's certain approaches that are best. Notice Proverbs 12, 18. Thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword, but wisely spoken words can heal. And we've all been hurt by words, haven't we? We've all been hurt by words. Mario started uh, our worship session today with that video about words. And words can hurt or words can help. Words can harm or words can edify and uplift. And so we have to be very careful what kind of words we use. Uh, thoughtless words can wound as deeply as any sword, but wisely spoken words can heal. In Proverbs 15.1, we all know this one, a soft answer turns away wrath. Somebody comes at you, and they're angry, they're upset, they, they just dump on you. <clears throat> How are you going to respond? Immediately, you want to put up the shield, you want to fight back. But a soft answer turns away wrath. It completely disarms the person. They're not expecting that. You, you can speak a kind word, a soft word, an unangry response, and the person is disarmed and will listen to you. So <clears throat> when you think about how you're going to say it, don't say it thoughtlessly because it'll hurt the person. Don't, don't just off the cuff say something thoughtlessly um, because the situation is such that you don't want to aggravate it. You want to help the situation. And, and don't say it offensively or it'll be received defensively. In, in marriage counseling sessions, um, I tell couples, look, there's certain things that will destroy a marriage, but the number one thing that will help your marriage or destroy your marriage is communication. You have to learn how to communicate with each other. And so when you guys, in other words, you have to learn how to fair fight. Anybody know what fair fighting is? That means that you can't argue about something, you can disagree about something, you, you can be vehement about something, but you do it fairly. You're not doing it unfairly. And one way to do that is if somebody is upset at their spouse and they come at them and they say, well, you always do this. Well, I don't care who you are. You don't always do the same thing all the time, right? That's just an unfair way of approaching the situation. If somebody says, you always do this, what are you going to do? Immediately you're going to throw up defense, right? You're going to back off. You're ready to fight back. <clears throat> so don't say it offensively or it will be received defensively. Don't say you always do this. Say like we said earlier. You know when you had this happen to you? Yeah. Well, that's how I feel when. And then you go into the situation and you talk with them about it. A soft answer turns away wrath. So don't say it thoughtlessly or offensively, but do lower your voice and say it in a gentle and humble way. Now, now immediately, <clears throat> some of you that are, that are working along with me on this, you're thinking to yourself, hey, this isn't easy. You're right, it's not easy. Remember we talked about digging deep? Going, going down into the tunnel of truth? <clears throat> yeah, it's not easy at all. It's not easy at all. You've you got to be willing to take time and effort to make these things happen so healing can take place, communication can take place, a, a true willingness to communicate can take place. So lower your voice, say it in a gentle and humble way. And that way, you can actually have a dialogue back and forth. You may not agree completely, but at least you're talking. And isn't that the goal? When the elephant's in the room, isn't it the goal to talk about the elephant? Yeah, of course it is. Otherwise, you're not talking about anything, and the problem persists. You've got to deal with the elephant that's in the room. And so plan how you're going to say it as well as <clears throat> when and what you're going to say. So plan your presentation. You check your motives. You plan your presentation. And then, as you're dealing with all this, give them affirmation. 
Give them affirmation. Proverbs 12, 25. Anxious hearts are very heavy, but a word of encouragement does wonders. A word of encouragement does wonders. So it's important to encourage someone, to give them affirmation. Let them know, hey, I, I care about you as a person. I value this relationship. That's why we're dealing with this issue. I'm not bringing it up to make you mad. I'm not bringing this up so that, that we can uh, be upset at each other or go uh, part our ways together. No, I'm bringing this up so we can deal with it and so we can move on. Because I love you. I care about you. I, I want our relationship to last and be complete and whole. And you have to affirm them and let them know that. So, so what do you do? Well, you affirm that you deeply love and care for the person. You, you affirm that you will pray for them and help them. You also affirm that you believe that they can change. You, you affirm that the relationship can be better, and that you can be even closer as a result of this confrontation. You see, you're looking for the best. You're looking for improvement. You're looking for the relationship to develop, not to separate. And so you're willing to humble yourself and communicate with the other person because you want what's best for the relationship itself. Remember that deacon I told you about that, that tried to fire me three times? Well, he ended up becoming one of the strongest supporters I had in that church by the time I left First Baptist Logan to come here. Because of all the things we went through, taking time to work with him and develop him and help him deal with his family issues, <clears throat> he became one of my strongest supporters. And they came through on their way to a vacation here in Florida one time, and they stopped by, and we went out to eat, and uh, we had... A wonderful conversation and sat down and, and they went on their way and Karen and I went home and I said, that's the weirdest thing that's ever happened to me. <laughs> Here's a guy who tried to fire me three times and we just had a great meal together. It can happen if you're willing to work through. If you're willing to tunnel down, you're willing to make sure the relationship is important and you're going to do your best to make it happen important. <clears throat> you see, the relationship can be better. And you can be closer if you're willing to do the work to make it happen. But listen, got to be honest about this. E even though you give them affirmation, um, you've you got to be willing to realize that you're taking a risk. You can always risk their rejection. You can always risk their rejection. Just because you approach them and just because you want the relationship healed doesn't mean that they're going to respond the way you want them to, right? Sometimes it just doesn't happen. Sometimes the other person is just not ready. Sometimes the other person doesn't want the relationship to heal. Sometimes the other person wants their way, and they're going to do everything they can to make it their way. And, and, and you just got to realize that that's going to happen. The Apostle Paul risked rejection, and it turned out well. He did that with the church at Corinth. He confronted them about a sin in the church, and he, he rebuked them, saying, you got to deal with a sin in the church and, and because you're enabling this guy. And you got to approach him. you got to confront him. you got to tell him what he's doing is not right. I know this makes you nervous. It makes you upset. It, it, it makes you anxious, but you got to do it. And so Paul wrote that letter not knowing how they were going to respond. The good news was they did respond. They realized they were wrong, and they confronted the man. And he actually repented of his sin. Notice what Paul wrote. I know I distressed you greatly with my letter. Although I felt awful at the time, I don't feel at all bad now that I see how it turned out. The letter upset you, but only for a while. You were jarred into turning things around. You let the distress bring you to God. And that is what I was hoping for in the first place when I wrote the letter. Paul took the risk that he would be rejected. But the result was they accepted what he said. 
They realized he was trying to help them, not hurt them, to strengthen them, not harm them. And as a result of that, the church dealt with the issue. The church became a better church for it. And Paul was able to strengthen his relationship with those members of that church. You see, you have to take the risk of rejection and do the right thing, even if they do not respond in the right way. The other deacon, the Sunday school teacher I told you about, we tried to get him to be <clears throat> resolved and, and um, make amends with the church, but uh, it didn't happen. He ended up leaving the church as a result of that. Sometimes you're just going to be rejected. The important thing is, is that you do the right thing. You try to make sure that issues are resolved because love speaks the truth. Let's pray together. Father, as we close this morning, our prayer is that each of us will have the courage, <coughs> the resolve, and, Father, the right spirit to deal with the issues that confront us. Lord, let us remember that people are more important than winning a point. Let us remember that relationships are the most important thing and that love is the main priority in life and that we are to do everything we can to make sure our relationships are in healthy, good order. And so, Lord, when it requires us to speak the truth in love, give us the boldness to do it, but also the right spirit, the right frame of mind. Now, Lord, we thank you that because we were at enmity, we were in a bad relationship with you, you took the initiative to send your son Jesus to die on the cross for us. You're the one that made the first step to make amends with us, to bring us into right relationship with you. Thank you, Lord Jesus, you died on the cross, you forgave our sins, you went to the grave and you rose again. And now you give us eternal life and you restore us into a right relationship with God. Father, I pray that if there's one here today that doesn't have that relationship with you, I pray this will be the day that they say yes to Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand together and sing. God is speaking to you this morning. You come as we sing together.